Hello and welcome. This is Business Edge on News Central. I'm Zodu Lokpe Adela Rubalogun. First, our headline story. Intra-African expansion of indigenous banks in Africa. The financial services sector on the continent has been expanding from South Africa upwards and from West Africa across the equator into the Horn of Africa and elsewhere. We'll also touch base with a few stories we're keeping our eyes on with NC4 to watch before we finish the show. Welcome to Business Edge. A change in Africa's banking landscape in recent years has seen the emergence and rapid expansion of Pan-African banking groups or holding companies. These banks have created significant cross-border networks and are, in some respects, overtaking the role of the European and United States banks, which had traditionally dominated banking activities in the sub-Saharan African region. The growth and expansion of African banks across the continent has been aggressive, and spearheaded primarily by banks from Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya. For example, EcoBank, by far the largest African bank in terms of physical presence, tripled its affiliate network in Africa between 2000 and 2015 from 11 to 36 countries. Nigeria's United Bank for Africa expanded from just one country to 19. EcoBank is also systematically important in quite a number of countries, it holds more than 10% of the banking assets in 13 of its 36 countries of operations, particularly dominating Liberia and Guinea, where it holds around 40% of total assets. All the major banks are beating a path to the doors of other African countries, taking their best to South Africa's immediate neighbors and increasingly continuing the trek up north. FNB has operations in seven sub-Saharan African countries and has launched its banking apps and digital services into these countries. NetBank has a presence in most neighboring countries and is now looking to East Africa. Stambic is one of the largest banking networks on the continent, with representation in 19 African countries and more than 1,100 branches. Kenya is a world leader in mobile money technology. Key to success in Kenya is the ability to create and grow products that respond to the needs of Kenyans for convenience and efficiency through alternative banking channels such as mobile, internet, and agency banking. This opens growth markets in other segments, including small and medium-sized enterprises, and the informal sector as well, that has traditionally been less involved in formal banking services. Access Bank from Nigeria is entering the Kenya market, and the advent of the fintechs across the continent with the success of M-Pesa in Kenya has shown more promise, particularly for the unbanked, and has become a means of ensuring financial inclusion. Now joining me on Business Edge is Shola Ademosu. He is a financial analyst and the head of risk at Page Financials. Shola, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Good morning, Toyo. Thank All you for having right, me. And happy New Year. So let's start with some things that unfortunately could be obstacles, and that is the fact that there are regulatory issues that are a bit central to each country. So regulatory differences, they happen to be a major challenge for these pan-African banks and their expansion plans across the continent. How are these being dealt with by the financial institutions? Okay, um, aside from regulatory differences, of course, there have been several other um, differences. There have been different legal systems, uh, level of adoption in terms of um, financial regulations, um, basal implementation as well. So there's been a host of differences, and um, on some on the, on the home front as well, we've seen some level of protect protectionism um, by central bank as well. Mm. So for most of the banks in their quest for expansion across Africa, we've seen a lot of brownfield acquisitions. Uh, we've seen Axis Bank recently acquired um, a number of banks in East Africa. We saw GT Bank as well enter into East Africa as well through the acquisition of Fina Bank as well. So um, I'll say the approach really has been to um, circle around the regulation and look for um, opportunities where banks have been undervalued through and enter through mergers and acquisitions. So um, I also think that the outlook as well going forward is that banks will continue to look for these opportunities for entry where they are cheap valuations to enter into acquisitions rather through the organic um, means of um, entry as well. So um, going forward, it's likely we'll see a lot of mergers and acquisition 
um, actions and activities going forward. Um, although um, the presence of obviously COVID has limited actions across um, Africa, but respect that as um, economies start to recover, we likely would see more of those actions going forward. Okay, so more actions towards mergers and acquisitions and moving towards that way. So let's also talk about some currency issues. There are regional currency unions spread across the continent. Um, we have a one, for example, the West African Monetary Union. And these particularly face challenges on the interface of responsibilities between regional and national authorities. How do individual central banks and even exchange commissions mediate in order to benefit their countries without also chasing away the possible investments that's brought by the expansion of these indigenous banks into other territory? Um, I would say that um, the banks that, I mean, all across Africa, where there's some level of uneven development. So depending on the level of development of, of the banking system or financial system in those countries, the response is quite different. So if you look at um, the regional um, monetary unions, like um, the West African Monetary Union, for instance, um, and you look at the East African, the, the, the outlook or the approaches are quite different. So if you look at Nigeria, for instance, like I said earlier, there's some level of protectionism. So uh, because we're at the level where at this moment, the most important thing is for the banks to be adequately um, capitalized. So the CBN has put in some regulations to restrict banks from um, entering into other expansion drives or entering into expansion drives mm -hmm. without being fully adequately or fully and adequately capitalized at home. But if you look at the approach from the East African regulators, it's been more of openness. So in Kenya, for instance, there's the round of consolidation that's going on. And the banks are open to ensure that um, entry of uh, regional Pan-African banks are happening to ensure that um, entry of capital also comes into the, into the country in terms of exchange of in terms of exchange of capital and improvement of efficiency across those banking industries. So I would say that the, the, the response has been mainly based on the level of the development of those banking industries. And um, I, I, like I said earlier, we would likely see a lot of, we'll still see a continuation of a round of um, consolidation happening, um, especially in East Africa as interest has also been growing, especially from Nigerian banks in that area. Okay, interesting enough, you did mention the fact that there is uneven development. What do you think this might play out in terms of how it um, affects expansion? Because these are services now, especially with fintechs coming into the picture, uh, mobile applications, making it easier for people to open accounts, to even get loans for their businesses. For those economies on the continent that happen to have a slower development pace than others, it might slow down having some of these banks come into the countries to offer these services. How can those on the um, lower end of this spectrum, how can they sort of match up to also be able to bring in these people that can help their economies themselves? Um, also, the approach that has been undertaken is one that has been most very commendable. But as long as those um, regulators have shown that um, there are opportunities for um, local foreign investors to come in to invest into their markets. Uh, one of the things that many of the Spanish African banks bring into um, local markets is they bring a lot of expertise, they bring a lot of capital. Mostly, many of those banks are well capitalized and they have large balance sheets. So, there's a lot of expertise and there's a lot of transfer of knowledge, and effectively, that would lead to improvements in the general level of financial stability in those countries. So, um, the, the focus for many of the regulators would be to create um, an enabling, enabling environment or create opportunities where um, opportunities where foreign banks can come in and play their parts and also do, do their part to ensure that the level of financial development in those countries is improved beyond where they are currently. Okay, let's talk about uh, depository insurance or depository protection. I think we did mention a bit of protectionist movement, um, but this is also an essential part of the regulatory framework for many countries and many economies. How does this fit into the larger expansion um, process and the larger expansion model that we're seeing play out in terms of keeping people's money and investors' money and whatever it may be safe um, in the countries? So I'll, I'll say um, the jury is still out. Um, there's a lot of debates, um, empirical and theoretical um, debates around how was uh, insurance. Well, generally, we've, I mean, what we've seen is that um, in combination with several other prudential and macro um, macro prudential regulations combine, combined with deposit insurance has led to some level of uh, financial stabilities in, in many economies. 
And when there's financial stability, there's some positive correlation as well with um, economic growth and development. So I'll say the relationship is not direct and I'll say it's not, um, it's not linear, but we've seen that where deposit insurance exists, there's some level of financial stability and where there's financial stability, there's some level of development in the economy as well. So it, it's, it's not a direct relationship, but I would say that for many banks that are considering expansion as well, um, the growth opportunities in those markets, whether positively related with deposit insurance is one of the major drivers as well. Mm -hmm. So um, banks look at how, um, look at the political terrain, they look at the macroeconomic indicators, and those are basically the key indicators that lead to those decisions to uh, enter into those markets. Okay, so before we go for a break, let's talk about cooperation because a lot of this has to do with a lot of cross-border um, inter-country uh, understanding and agreements. So cooperation on cross-border supervision has started across the continent, but we see that there are efforts to strengthen uh, consolidated oversight, and many agree that those efforts need to be intensified. Who really do you think needs to take the bulk of responsibility in regards to this? And then what exactly should be done in terms of further improving banking across borders? So I would start with what currently exists and I would, I would say um, what I believe should exist. So currently, um, especially in the West African market, there's some level of cooperation with the regulators. There's, um, there's a college of supervisors. So, um, and even in Nigeria, for instance, one of the criteria as a prerequisite for you expanding outside of Nigeria is that there must be some bilateral memorandum of understanding between um, the home and the host where um, the banks are hoping to expand. So I'll say there's been some level of movement on that side, but I think that what the ideal situation will be with some of these regulatory frameworks as well, it's really within the regional blocks need to be strengthened. And there's also a need to ensure that some of these bilateral MOEs could be legally binding. I know there might be some questions around sovereignty of um, the nations mm -hmm. as to those, those, those issues. But ideally, would, the ideal situation would be we strengthen what exists already, create a framework that works, create a legally binding framework that works as well, strengthen the College of Supervisors. Then ultimately, I think the long-term long goal would be that there should be some Pan-African um, supervisory regulation that is consistent so if you look at um, East Africa, so for instance, the some the regulation is not could likely be changed different from what it had occurs in West Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's also important, and their banks are exist in those markets. So they're they are working towards some regulation in one market, and there's a different regulation in one market. So there's some uneven regulation on both sides, but it's important that there's one cohesive and consistent regulation across all the markets where the banks might be operating. And we've seen that happen in in Europe. Although um, the situation in Africa might be slightly different, but we believe that, or I believe that um, if there is some Pan-African supranational um, body that exists that, that is in charge of macro prudential regulation, is also in charge of financial system um, financial system stability as well. I mean, that, that would be the ideal situation where um, supervision and regulation should go through. Okay, Shola, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get into some more issues. East Africa seems to be the destination. You have to tell us why that is. We also look at uh, what this means for the millions of unbanked Africans across the continent and also what the future holds for indigenous African banks. We will have that conversation on Business Edge when the show returns. Please stay with us. And this is Business Edge. I still have with me Shola Ademosu. He's the head of risk at Page Financials. Um, now, Shola, let's look at East Africa, which seems to be the destination of choice right now in terms of the recent um, expansion we're seeing, particularly from African banks. What exactly is going on in the East that they have that's bringing all these people to the yard? What is it that other people can look at emulating in terms of what's bringing everyone to them? Okay, so um, so for East Africa as well as regional economic performance, macroeconomic performance in the last few years has surpassed the rest of the regional economic blocks in Africa and mm. surpassed that of Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So we've seen a lot of um, political changes in those areas as well. We've seen a lot, of, uh, so we've seen a lot of trade linkages and we've seen a lot of inter-regional inter cooperation as well. 
So, um, and that's created, created incentives for banks to want to follow their customers to where um, they do business really. So as long as those macroeconomic indicators are positive and regional expansion continues, and also in light of the Africa Free Trade Continental Trade Agreement, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So there's optimism that intra-Africa trade would, would increase and um, being and East Africa basically will be the bedrock of expansion into other sectors, maybe Central Africa and possibly South Africa as well. So it, it's been more of um, optimism as to the growth prospects in those markets as well, especially in the home markets where uh, there's some level of saturation due to competition and the likes. And they need to also diversify yields and look for opportunities. Oh, really do have some issues there, unfortunate, and really want to get to the meat of it in terms of what it means for the average African, 350 million unbanked. That is just an absolute beautiful number waiting to be taken advantage of. And we've seen that fintechs have entered that space with uh, mobile applications that are addressing issues that have lain there for many years. Uh, they're making sure that they are solving problems, which is something we need in a different way. And we also have to ask why traditional financial institutions didn't get into the fintech space as early as they could. And it almost seems it was outside players that have come in to really change that area. We're going to have to let Sholak go for this conversation. Hopefully we'll be able to get him back in the future and we'll continue this conversation as we look at the intra-Africa expansion of indigenous banks and also looking at the benefits for um, the average Af um, African, whether you're Kenyan, you're Rwandan, you're Nigerian, you're South African, you're Ugandan, as these banks are coming into your countries and into your economies, how can you benefit? How can you take advantage of this? We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be wrapping things up with NC4 to watch. Stay with us. My guest on today's show was Shola Ademosu. He's a financial analyst and also the head of risk at Page Financials. We look forward to having him back. Now to NC4 to watch. These are a few stories we are keeping our eyes on. Morocco will build a wind farm along the country's Atlantic coast. Moroccan energy company Naraba Holding and Italian Renewable Energy Corporation and all Green Power will co-manage the wind farm. The wind farm will have a total capacity of... 270 megawatts and require an investment of 2.8 billion Morocco dirham or about 314 million dollars. Now moving just down into the eastern part of the continent, Kenya's inflation rate for the month of December edged upwards to an eight-month high of 5.62 percent from 5.33 percent the previous month. A rise in the prices of essential food items, transport, electricity, water, Gas and other fuels such as kerosene and paraffin contributed to a surge in the December cost of living index. The National Statistical Office's latest figures show that food inflation had the most significant price increases between November and December 2020 at 2.45%. And I will probably say you have to have been living under a rock if you haven't heard this news. The price of Bitcoin surged more than 9% on Saturday to surpass the $33,000 mark for the first time ever. This comes after crossing three $1,000 increment jumps in less than four hours earlier in the day. On Sunday, the price rose by more than 5% and crossed the $34,000 mark, pushing its total market valuation by over $600 billion. Even as all other markets were closed due to the holiday weekend, the world's leading cryptocurrency surge was driven by increase in investor appetites by both retail and institutional investors. And finally, we are in the western part of the continent where Nigeria says it has spent almost 2 trillion naira on debt servicing payments from January to September 2020. And this is the latest data from the Debt Management Office. The DMO disclosed that the nation's total public debt stock rose by 1.21 trillion naira in the third quarter of last year to 31.22 trillion naira amid revenue shortfalls. The debt stock is made up of the domestic and external debt stocks of the federal government of Nigeria, the 36 state governments, and the federal capital territory. And that's it on this edition of Business Edge. Follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. 
Head to our website and download our mobile app on Play Store and iOS. Till next time, I'm Tony Lokwe at Dilaru Balogun.